Hi there, welcome to the More Simple Podcast. This is a podcast for Blacks, Asians, and those who love them. I am Mo, and I am your host, ready to spark your curiosity as I take you on this adventurous ride of exploring cultures through the stories of my guests from all over the world. On this show, we get really personal, discussing salient issues that are relevant to our contemporary age and also building community around them. As our guests exercise courage and vulnerability in sharing their life's experiences, we hope that in turn you are inspired by them and that you get the courage in it to set your own stories free. Enjoy the ride and thank you so much for listening. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is Mo, and I want to just thank you for tuning in today. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome aboard. You're in for a lot of treats. Today's topic is a little bit, um, how do I explain it? I think it's just something that I think we need to really talk about as being Nigerian. And even though I've lived in the U.S. for a decade now, I still love my country. And when things come up, Sometimes, you know, you, you you can always know what's happening in Nigeria by just looking at your WhatsApp status. And so recently, there's been just a spate of um, WhatsApp statuses featuring serious stuff, but the way Nigerians tend to cope with trauma is we make jokes about it, we laugh about it. And the funnier the jokes, the sadder the situation. So on that um, note, today I have with me someone that I think um, can do a good job of just talking about these issues that are coming up in the country. There's this looming sense of doom coming up which you know, I really hope it doesn't come to that. But we'll just, you know, just talk about some of these issues. And um, so her name is uh, Adeze Vanessa Nana. She's also known as a daddy explorer. Get it? She's a lawyer. And like many Nigerian youths, she's also an entrepreneur. She describes herself as an adventure seeker. And she founded Termit by a daddy explorer in 2017. And this was based on the inquiries she got from people regarding her adventures. I have been on one of her tours and this lady is just a dynamo. She does it so well. She's super organized. She's super cheerful. She has, she's a history buff as well. She loves to travel. She enjoys sharing her world with others. If you have the um, good good fortune of following her on WhatsApp, she's always having like interesting stuff and things that can also make you really think a lot. She earned her money card enjoyment minister by visiting you know tw- twenty six out of thirty six states in Nigeria. That's a that's an achievement right there. And she has been to 16 other countries, despite having a green passport. Guys, you know, that's an achievement as well. Her goal is to see the world. And some of her dreams include being a globally renowned travel reporter and putting Nigeria on the tourism map in the international space. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming Ada back to the show. She's been on the show before, so go go catch up on her previous episode where we just talk about tourism in Nigeria. But today we are doing something else, a little bit differently. So Ada, thank you so much for coming back again. Really appreciate the... Thank you so much for having me, Mo. It's good to be back here. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. So there's been a looming insecurity challenge, a sense of insecurity in Nigeria for some time now. It's if it wasn't the you know people in the north, the cattle cattle bearers, the president, you know, just doing some things on Twitter, which is not so presidential. But in recent months, things have really escalated. I think a lot of this unrest I would attribute to the lockdown. I think that also really showed just the huge, you know, inequality we have in Nigeria as far as income and so many other inequalities. What do you make of these current happenings? And right now, do you feel really, how, how safe do you feel being in the country? Um, thank you so much for the question, Mo. Um, Nigeria is literally falling apart as we speak. It's been insane from headsmen attacks to kidnappings to um just gunmen you know killing people everywhere robberies in fact it's just been from one bad news to another and recently in the east it's just really escalated the army is threatening people shooting at people the police and the state governments there's not helping matters things have just been going from bad to worse like you cannot pick up a newspaper and see a pleasant headline. It's impossible. It's one 
bloodbath after another. And before it used to be northeast and there used to be like a lot of terrorism going on there. But right now it's everywhere. Even in Lagos, just yesterday, robbers, armed robbers, not just robbers now, armed robbers were killing and maiming people on Echo Bridge and people were running for their lives. It was insane. I heard that some people were jumping into the lagoon. Honestly, Nigeria does not feel safe at all at the moment. I even put up a a chart, you know, on like the different places you can visit. Maybe we'll still touch on it later if you ask me more questions. But on that chart, there was no place, no state in Nigeria is safe at all. I think Lagos was like the one that is a bit manageable. But even Lagos is not safe at all. So right now, if you're coming to Nigeria, you have to be very, very careful. Very guarded. Wow. I mean, this is this is just pretty sad. And you, what you said about the Eco Bridge, my friend also confirmed yesterday, because I called her, you know, being single, living by herself. She's one of the people that I really, really worry about when I hear things about, you know, happening in Nigeria. And she confirmed that she had to turn back because she was on her way to work and she was like, no, that's not going to happen. And then she was on her way to work because she was going back home, whatever the time of day was. Now, um, just to kind of segue out of that question would be recently our president, you know, Buhari recently posted a tweet. Where he, <laughs> I think he's, he's, let me, don't let me call, call him out of context. It was those of us in the fields for 30 months who went through the war would treat them in the language they understand, them being, you know, evils. Yes. And he was making allusion to the civil war. Mm-hmm. I find that very reckless coming from, you know, the number one, I guess, overseer of a country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so although Twitter has taken down that tweet, no, nobody forgets because, you know, there's always people that click, they can click that tweet. Mm-hmm. How did that message make you feel, given that, you know, this is your tribe as an evil woman? Uh, it was really, really... Uh... It was really sad, to be honest, you know. But I found it very interesting that a lot of people kicked against it. Even people that are not Igbo, you know, they came out and they said, no, this is very bad. This is uncalled for. Uh, Boko Haram and all other terrorist organizations have been terrorizing the country for decades, for a decade at least. And nobody has ever come out to say, oh, we're going to treat you in the language you understand. Nobody, you know. But this is, this is just a, a group of people who are tired of the situation and they would rather have it a better way. But you're coming out to say things like this, you know, it's really, really, it's really unfair. And it just goes to show that the Igbos have not been forgiven for, you know, what happened in 1969. So it's just really, really unfair. It makes us feel as if we're not part of the union called Nigeria. I don't know what to call it. The federation called Nigeria just makes Igbos feel, you know, like outcasts and all of that. But regardless, we know that the president should do better. He should actually be the one trying to unite the country. He should actually be the one saying, I remember when he first started ruling, he said something about, um, I'm for no one and for everyone. I wish he would just implement that. You know, it's not just one section of the country that voted for him. Everybody did. Even though some people try to claim now that they didn't vote for him. No. The whole of Nigeria voted for him. So he should try to be Nigeria's president, not just Arewa's president or not just the president of the North. Yeah. So that, I think that's just my take on that. I mean, I very much agree with you. And I think it's so rich coming from him, you know, um, because what I see happening in the East, I see it as a reaction to a lot of the instability we've been having in other geo- geopolitical zones. Yeah. And on that, that stuff you had shared in your, um, that post you had made on your Instagram by PR24, the travel advisory. Yeah. If you look at the states that had the extreme risk level, mm-hmm. there were mostly states that were under, you know, let me just call him where his people are from. So yeah. if we're going to play the tribalism card, like he needs to put his house in order before he starts, you know, throwing stones in glass houses. Exactly. Um, now, for those that might not really know, a little bit of a historical context here. Context here, We had the Nigerian Civil War in, I think, 1967 69. to 1970. 1969 to 1970 or 1960. I think it was for like two years. And um, this was when there was a movement called the Biafra. They they wanted to secede from Nigeria. And it was um, champ- championed by um, General, well, he's retired, he's, he's late now. Ojuku, and there's been 
a little bit of an uprising with the um, the kind of nationalistic nationalist movement. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not my my history is a little bit shaky on that. But there's also been talks of having to you know go through that route again. But I wanted to ask you this, Ada. Given what we know about, you know, Biafra and all that, as an Easterner, what's your views about the campaign for Biafra in the southeastern part of the nation? Are you for or against it? Uh, this is a very, very sensitive topic. <laughs> um, am I for or against Biafra? To be honest, I don't know how to answer that question, especially because um, I wasn't alive when the war happened so i don't even have like a first-hand experience and i don't ever want to have a first first-hand experience of that um to be honest i can't say for sure that biafra will do better because it's the same set of politicians but that notwithstanding to be honest nigeria as a federation isn't doing well at all and it will be nice to see if when broken up we'll do better, to be honest, because nothing has worked so far. So why don't we do something different? It's just like saying that if you continue to do something the same way, you're going to expect a different result. That's impossible. So if you do something differently, maybe something better will come out. Like, I don't even see any reason why um, the whole secession is a problem. It's, it's actually in the constitution that, you know, Nigeria can't divide I know it's also in the U.S. Constitution that, you know, the Federation has to be one geopolitical entity. But I feel like that's just a, it's Nigeria is just a marriage of Western idea. It's, it's such a mirage. I don't feel like it's Nigeria is solid enough to actually stand because we're just too many tribes that don't understand each other. And sometimes when something is not working, you just have to go your separate ways. So it will be nice to see how that would turn out. But if it can be done peacefully, if it can be amended straight from the constitution and done peacefully, then yes, I'd like to see how that pans out. Man, um, I, I agree with you. I think it was the first marriage that has gone on for too long. And, but I still feel like there's still hope. Because the way I see the U.S., the U.S. to me feels like it should be United Countries of America. Cause states do have their own power to like run their own government and all that. But of course, they're still accountable to the, you know, at the federal, federal. level. Yeah. But I feel like, um, in Nigeria, even though there's some power, you know, at state levels, there's just so much burden on the office of the presidency and there's so much oversight. Our problem is we have, there's, oh my gosh, there's so much redundancy that, you know, it, it doesn't really help for effectiveness and efficiency in running the government. So if states can be allowed to, you know, um, be a bit more autonomous with at least, you know, um, some representativeness on the central level, I think it might still work, you know, because if those areas succeed, where are they going to go? You know, and I think for so long, the government hasn't done a good job in harmonizing, you know, these the, the different factions. Like you go to the north, like I served in the north, even though it was for like, what, three, four weeks, you can see the stark differences, you know, the values they have. I mean, when I say values, like thoughts on education as a whole, and just, you know, a lot of discrepancies in terms of, you know, poverty alleviation. And so mm -hmm. issues like that makes you wonder, is this really, really one Nigeria? And um, and also talking about, you know, the movement, you know, IPOB, which is, you know, headed by Kano. Um, I, I look back and from what I remember from history, for those that might not really know, um, I think the Afra as a movement started, because of the heavy persecution of Igbos, which was done from June to October of 1966, there were a lot of programs in the north that killed tens and thousands of Igbo people, and it caused a lot of displacement. And even though this was done, what, you know, almost more than 50 years ago, or yeah, more than 50 years ago, the sentiments have never left, because there's no way you can forget that kind of history. So I think the distrust that comes from the government is still something that is really, really heavy among the Igbos. And to come around and, you know, make those kind of killer statements as that, that was made by, you know, the president through his tweets, I don't think it was very, very sensitive and, you know, um, wise of him. Yeah. And, um, well, can I quickly say um, something? Um, during, sure, the civil, sure. during the civil war, um, a hundred thousand people plus were murdered and then over a million children starved because of the farming. There was a blockade. So Nigeria, 
didn't allow food to enter into the eastern territories, Biafra. So over a million children starved to death. And that's not to talk, I'm not even counting the people that were maimed and, you know, lost body parts and all of that. So honestly, it was such a brutal ordeal. And then after the war, people were given 20 pounds to go and restart their lives, regardless of how much they had in their accounts. And then you can't own property also. So to be honest, like Igbo people went through a lot. So we don't want to be reminded of all that, even though Nigeria has deliberately removed teaching of history in schools. I was going to say that. Yeah. I learned, the way I learned it, it was a liner. Yeah. I remember it was social studies. I remember I was in primary three or four and it was just a line word. Civil War was 1967 to 1970. Yeah. Next. Yeah. That was it. That was it. Mm-hmm. I know. If we don't know our, our history, we're doomed to like, you know, yes. read it. Exactly. And if we go, if we, if we start having all this, you know, um, us versus them mentality, you don't even understand where them are coming from. Let me, you know, say it that way. Yes. Now, um, let me ask you this. So across the country, there are agitations from various groups. You know, the Southeast is calling for Biafra. The Southwest is clamoring for the Oduduwa Republic yeah. and from the Southwest region. At the same time, the North, which, you know, they've been super favored to be at the homes of affairs, is host to most of the insecurity challenges, such as kidnapping, banditry, and the killer, you know, I call, let me just put this label on them, even though it's not all of them, yeah. but the killer full and headsmen. Do you think this calls for disintegration are really a solution to Nigerians, Nigeria's issues as many are seeking? Um, like I said earlier, it might not be a solution, but it's a step forward, to be honest. Because Nigeria as a whole is really like, it's like, um, having, what do you call this this thing that when you have two horses in front a chariot exactly oh, chariot, have, yeah. exactly if you have two horses in front of a chariot and one has a bad knee how far are they going to move it's just going to be only one dragging that carriage and it's going to be very difficult so imagine that nigeria is a chariot and you have a couple of horses in front but like one or two of them are just not work, walking. They're just not, they're moving others backwards. Some people just want to break free and move forward. And I think it's what a try. We've done this for over 60 years and it's not working. What else should we do? We need to do something differently. I know like right now, <laughs> if anybody in the helm of, go- or in the helm of government should hear you know what I'm saying right now. I could even be arrested. It's that crazy. They don't ever want to hear about it. that's because a certain section they are benefiting from the poverty. They are benefiting from the corruption. No matter how much they come out and preach against these things, they are actually benefiting from it, and they want things to remain exactly as they are. That's why everybody just has to break free. Let's try something different. Let's see if it works. Um, I do appreciate your response to that and I just still have a distrust of the government because I still think that it's still going to be the same of the same but I hope that even when we do get to that crossroad we always we end up making the right decision because this is this, these decisions are not quick and easy fixes there's so many implications for them. I mean, look at what's happening in Sudan right now mm-hmm. you know and and even some other areas Korea is one also even though that's a totally different conversation <laughs> and even even casting our mind back to what happened just last year, you know, the Lekki Gates massacre. Exactly. Up until now, the government is still yet to, like, you know, give a full and truthful report about what really, really happened. Yes. Who, you know, orchestrated that? Who caused the death of these people? And, you know, um, even the, the DJ that started it all, we don't even know if her, you know, security is still guaranteed. So there's just so many, so many issues. Even though we're in a democratic era, I grew up, you know, in the 80s, and I remember just that fear that fear of being under a military era is mm-hmm. just coming up again. And I'm not even living in Nigeria currently. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. yeah so. That's what Nigeria does to you. <laughs> you gotta love that country. A lifetime of PTSD. <laughs> we, 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 we're, we're, all, we're all in this together. Now, um, what, what safety precautions do you think people should take in this period of heightened tension? Because I say this because, you know, when COVID happened, I felt like it brought out the best and the worst out of everybody. Mm-hmm. And whatever inequalities we had, it was very stark. 
They're telling people to stay at home. You know, kids are already being left behind. Education is already, and I'm going to just be very truthful about this. It's a joke. If yeah. they're not properly regulated, if you don't have money, good money in Nigeria, your kids are going to suffer. And it shouldn't be like that. Healthcare is a mess. So you tell people to stay at home. You, if you deploy the military. You start putting all these sanctions and, you know, um, coffees and all that. And even the relief packages, we saw, you know, so many memes around, you know, Instagram and Twitter about what some households were getting. It wasn't even enough to write on. We heard about mm-hmm. the good thing. We saw videos and pictures of, you know, warehouses that were used to store these things that were not even distributed, even though the money was, was earmarked for it. And then the people came out of, you know, this lockdown. A lot of people have lost their jobs. They don't even have, you know, they didn't even have, some didn't even have jobs to start up with. But, um, given that it's such, there's so much tension going on going on now on top of you know you know covid the post effect of covid and all of that what safety precautions do you think people should take you know during this period of that okay it's just that we need to be more cautious of our environment i've always said this when you're stepping out of your house you need to tell somebody where you're going And even when you're in transit you need to let them know how it's going and when you get to where you're going you need to let them know that you've got in there it's just increased levels of cautiousness we need to be more cautious we need to manage our journey wisely if you're using an uber or a boat just share your journey with a friend you know these are not the times where you you'll be hiding where you're going to so people that are living double lives and keeping secret affairs this is not the best time for you you need to be open about your whereabouts at every given moment very very important because the rate at which that people are being kidnapped even in lagos in broad daylight in open places like lekki so we're not even talking about um far places you know like on the border you know we're talking about open cities towns you know kidnappings are going on and they'll just ask for ridiculous sums just so that they can feed. People are that hungry. The last time I checked, Naira to dollars is, is, is at 500 right now. It's at 500. So things are really, really going. It's insane. And then the red zones are places that you should not even travel to at all. So places like um, the Northeast where tensions coming from Boko Haram terrorism is heightened we shouldn't even bother going there at all and for those that are not you know very versed in the landscape of Nigeria when we talk about Lekki Lekki is like a highbrow area think of it like the Manhattan of you know of Nigeria and now uh, I do say so you know <laughs> place of, um, <laughs> proudly um and then because I know that the spate of kidnappings have increased, but kidnapping has always been an issue. Even growing up in Nigeria as a young child, I remember that a lot. My mom would say, don't talk to strangers, you know, and then we walk to school ourselves. And we had a lot of expats then, you know, around, you know, the country. And those ones were the ones they would kidnap and, you know, so they could get more bang for their buck. But now with, you know, um, travel being restricted, not many countries are sending their, you know, um, foreign attaches to Nigeria. Now they've turned you know, to, to their citizens. Because I remember um, the story of the young lady, um, Inyobong Omoren, who was the Akwai Bum lady who yes. was, you know, she was seeking a job and she was kidnapped. So um, this is just a little bit of a thought and a pause that I hope, I pray her soul rest in peace. I can't even imagine what her, you know, family is, you know, going through. But I like your, that your advice of, you know, um, make sure you tell somebody where you're going. Don't move around, you know, aimlessly. If you, if you don't need to go somewhere, just stay at home. It's better to be, you know, safe than sorry. Yeah. Now, um, you are in, I would say, even you're a lawyer by day, you also run, you know, Tommy by Ada. How has this insecurity situation affected your business with tourism? Because there's one thing I like about what you do. You take people, um, you, I feel like, you know, an upcoming Anthony Bourdain of Nigeria, <laughs> where you take people to like, you know, less known places. You're so big on culture. You're so big on, on history. There was a, one thing you did on Instagram some months back about taking each state and, you know, highlighting the importance of that. And I think what you do is so very important, especially for people like me that, you know, are like travel boss. But given that, you know, this there's this insecurity, how do you think that has, or how has that affected, you know, your business? It has affected us tremendously. Um, there are some places in Nigeria that you really want to go to because of, you know, the things that you've heard, you know, but we can't even go. So take, for instance, somewhere like um, Obuju, 
yeah you know that before you get there you have to to fly and then when you get there you take a bus but you don't know how safe the road trip is going to be so of course you're not going to go there but that's not even a volatile zone you know some other places like um what's it called now Yankari Game yeah. Reserve, maybe. God bless you. Yankari Game Reserve. You don't even want to go up there. Um, my friends and I have actually been planning to go to Yankari for the past three years. We've never got a chance to. So the only time that we even wanted to go, then um, COVID started, so we couldn't even we couldn't. So it's it's just been crazy. Like there are so many places we would love to go to. You just have to be very, very careful. It's not like when you go there now and then something happens. People now start blaming you. Oh, why did you go? You know that this kind of thing is happening there. You shouldn't have gone and all of that. So it's, it's really, really impacting the business. When people think of travel right now, they're already scared. Like, ah, oh, I don't want to go anywhere. Or, you know, so it's really impacting the business. Most of the stuff that I do right now is just um, throwbacks. And, and then, uh, I, I repeat places that I've been to that I think are relatively safe, um, that people will be more comfortable going back to. Yeah. Wow. That, that's really quite sad. That's really, really quite sad because there's some areas that are really rely. I mean, I feel like as a whole in Nigeria, Tourism is one underdeveloped area. Our government yes. couldn't do much in promoting that. And when you have people like you, you know, trying to highlight the the virtues and you know the the hot, not even the hot spots, but like the uniqueness of different geopolit- geopolitical mm-hmm. areas, and you have this effort being stymied by you know insecurities. And I can imagine a lot of my you know um, friends from developed countries thinking, "What are the police doing? What are the military doing? <laughs> uh, do I have a story for you guys?" They're not always very competent, and sometimes they don't know who the true cops are because anybody can (laughs) literally mount an illegal, you know, road mount on the road and get money from you and extort you. And it's not always safe. You have to keep watching your back. Um, Which brings me to my next point, Ada. So, I mean, there are a lot of us here in the diaspora, and I always warn those of us in diaspora that we shouldn't look at Nigeria like a project we can fix or we come from this place of, oh, I know more than you. No, I think. Whether you're from, wherever you are, home is always going to be home. But don't come from that place of, I'm levitating above the rest, you know, because now you've lived in the abroad for a while. We should, we have, there's so much we, stand, we can still learn from each other, and no one is above the other person. But what can we do to help? You know, what, what can we sincerely do to help for those of us that are here? To be honest, the only thing I can see that uh, the people in diaspora can do is just to keep raising awareness about the things that are going on in Nigeria. Because the more people see it, the more attention that we receive, the more likely it is that, you know, these these bad things will be exposed. And you know what happens when you expose bad, bad things? I mean, people tend to, you know, gradually stop doing them. So I think basically that's it because there's really not much you can do from outside the country. Even us that are here, there is also a limit to what we can do. It's just left for the government to do something. The government just has to do something. They have to step in. They have to step up, you know. Um, I just heard now before I came on this, on this, uh, meeting that the government is planning to ban Twitter completely from Nigeria. Like we keep going from frying pan to fire at like every single time you think something is in- improving, it just b- gets blocked. Like, I, don't I blame Desmond Ellis for that. <laughs> I blame Desmond Ellis for that. He I blame, blame him for me. that. <laughs> I blame him too. That's man. <laughs> Imagine if Twitter had brought their headquarters to Nigeria. I just wonder. They would have used DSS, EFCC, and all their puppet organizations to intimidate and harass the poor organization. It's so crazy. Like, Nigeria is such a joke. I don't know. I don't know. You know, you know I, I, what you're just saying reminded me of, you know, that um, fairy tale. I don't know if it was a one true or fairy tale, but let's just assume it was a fairy tale because I read it in the books. Um, the Pied 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 of Hamelin. Mm-hmm. When the rats start sinking and then leave, you know, there's always trouble. So, you know, we have a, a lot of, you know, conglomerates living the country. Like ShopRite right now, I heard they've been sold to, they've been in Nigeria yeah. for 10 years. They sold their business to a Persian group. Yeah. And you have so many other, you know, big companies. I know PZ left, they moved their headquarters many years ago because 
they couldn't you know um afford the cost of having to pay for you know generators and you know uh, the unsteady um power supply really made for really bad you know business decisions and and now you, you have a government trying to um i guess shut down freedom of speech that to me is like going backward yes because you see that happening in countries like Myanmar where they've had a lot of unrest and by the time a country starts doing that it, it, <laughs> but you know what i have hope for the tech the technocrats and the gurus in nigeria because they'll always find a way yeah they will. you know they try doing that and they, they will always find a way mm-hmm. i'm so i know the government has said too many things about the nigerian youth but they give me so much hope now some stories are sad but i know that these youth you know they won't they're not going to take it lying down mm-hmm. because they were the generation you know raised on technology and they are very inventive with technology so they can ban twitter and do all that but they always find a way Definitely. i'm very very hopeful of that but yes so I guess I think, you know, just being more vocal and using, playing our strength to power will be one of the ways we can help yeah. as far as those that are here. And I think even engaging in conversations with key leaders, if you are in a place of authority or you mm-hmm. know somebody, you know how, you know, everybody in Nigeria is like six or seven degrees of separation away from somebody in power. So, you know, <laughs> use your power for good and hopefully we can make some long lasting solutions. Now, um, for those that are coming to Nigeria, take for example, this is summertime now. A lot of Nigerians want to travel tra- in the diaspora, want to yeah. travel back home, go see their friends, their family, or even if God forbid, you know, I hope these issues are resolved, you know, in quick in quick time before the you know Christmas holidays. But what suggestions do you have for people that intend to travel home? Um, for people that want to come back, I'm not saying don't. Uh, you yeah, you should definitely come back home. Um, but obviously, safety precautions cannot be overemphasized. Just make sure that you're as cautious as possible starting from the airports um yeah if you can leave your accents where you're coming from please do <laughs> yeah it's just i just be as careful as possible and make sure that you have somebody to come and pick you from the airports um no public cars or whatever you know have someone come get you and just just generally be very careful hmm. those are very you know wise words and i know there's been uh whatever circulating you know, I mean, okay, so a little bit of a historical context. We got our name, Nigeria. It's actually in Niger area and it was given to us by, was it Fiona Shaw, who later yeah. went on to marry, you know, Lord, um, Lugard, Lugard. I think. Um, Frederick, yeah, Frederick Lugard. And now there's been a proposition to change our name to United African Republic and Nigerians and Twitter. You, you gotta love us. Like we have ways of just making jokes out of like, really really serious situation i just wanted to you know share that like you are like you know united arab emirates united you know um states of america now united Amer- african republic oh nigerians you gotta yes. love them um <laughs> now <laughs> um i have two more questions for you in in your opinion uh ada what are the next steps you think the government must take to avert any further escalation to the state of insecurity and to bring a long lasting solution to this, you know, issues that we've been having. And these are really quite chronic issues that I didn't think began with this government, but this government has certainly not done, you know, a lot to like, you know, call these issues. They've actually worsened it. Um, this government needs more dialogue. This government does not have a human face with the people. That's the major problem. I don't know if you remember the time of Yara Dua when uh the militants were just going haywire kidnapping experts literally every day they had to have dialogue they had to sit down with these militants face to face ask them what they actually want and they sorted that out with amnesty you know the government has been trying to do that the present government has been trying to do that now with Boko Haram and all that but they're not even the same type of organization because Boko Haram is a terrorist group so there shouldn't even be any kind of dialogue. There should be war against them, which I think that maybe they've been doing, but I don't think they've been doing it effectively. What the government needs to do now with like, you know, the other kinds of insecurity issues that we've been having, especially in Lagos and maybe in the East, they need to reach out to people who are closer to these people. These people are not ghosts. Like um the Oni of Ife said, I don't know, in a recent viral, viral uh, video i don't know if you if you watched it he said that these people are close to home these are people that we know on the streets or in the villages call them ask them what's going on these people are just hungry offer them oh god employment they need they need jobs they need to do something they need to feed once they keep themselves engaged there won't be any room for the devil to play with them 
I don't know if I'm if I'm making sense. You know, but the government is so nonchalant, especially this government. God, I've never seen any government in Nigeria like this one that is so nonchalant about the situation. They just don't care. And they are always looking for excuses. It's, it's just ridiculous. You should hear the, the, the president talk. That's when he decides to talk. He doesn't even address the country ever. He doesn't want to know what's going on. So this government needs to have a very, very human face. They need to be able to address issues as they come. Not wait for it to pile up and then get worse. Then they'll now release one or two tweets, you know, on Twitter. It's just ridiculous. They need to reach out to these people that are on ground. Use local government chairmen. Use village chiefs. Use state government officials to reach out to these people so that we know what the problem is and we can douse the tension. So that's basically what I think the government needs to do at this point. I mean, I, I super duper agree with you. And I think that in addition to what you said, the strength in Nigeria lies in the empowerment of its youth. We are a younger population as far as a younger nation, rather, as far as, you know, the population of youth we have, more than 40% of our current population right now are those, you know, classify them as Nigerian youth. And I feel like there's so many untapped, you know, potential. We've been told so many lies, or oh, we are the future. Now we are here, like there's really not much. Youth unemployment rates are so high. And I do agree with you that, you know, the government hasn't done a lot to like, you know, um, embody that population. If anything, he's, I've heard him call us lazy people, you know, so many derogatory terms. And these are the same people that despite not giving anything, they've made an oasis out of a desert. With yeah. limited, you know, or no help from the government. Mm-hmm. Just imagine what a little bit of help can, you know, go. A little bit of help will go a long way in really empowering the youth. And I think that's where the um, the hope is. So when I when I hear people like Desmond Elliott, which I don't, who I don't really, I don't know so much about, but as far as I've heard about him, he hasn't really been quite encouraging because younger people like him getting into, you know, these places of position, you think they would, you know, use their power for good and for all of that but you know there's still hope i'm not gonna write him off but i you know um i think another way is for to, to get younger people in, in governance and help them like you know do the right thing because it's definitely gonna be a top-down approach there's only so much willpower you can do as an engineering youth if you don't have the backing of your government if you don't have social you know um safety nets in place it's just gonna be the same of the same but I believe that our youth are superstars. I mean, think about Nigerians leaving that country and going to other, you know, developed nations. They become superstars. Yes. You know, and, and they become superstars. And so like it goes you, to show that it's not the people. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm trying to, I'll take it. It's not, the, it's not the youth themselves. We, we are a breed of resilient people. And it's why I'm always going to be proud of Nigerian. And I know that with a little help, we can go a long way. So finally, Ada, what hopes do you have for Nigeria, if any? Are you still hopeful about mm. the country? So I used to say that I, I lost all hope for Nigeria in 2015 when Buhari got elected. Um, but right now that he only has two more years to go, I think I'm starting to have more hope. Um, I've always known from day one that he wasn't going to be a good president. I always knew because like Nigerians are so forgetful. We don't remember our history. We don't even know our history. Most people don't know what he did when he was uh, a military head of state the first time. And even when they heard it, they, they probably didn't believe it. Or they just felt that, oh, he was such a dictator or such a powerful person that people fell in line. But falling in line is never the way forward. You know, oppression and and uh, what's that word now? You know, authoritarianism is never the way forward. You know, the, the, the governments that we see now that are making progress, they're all democracies. And there's a reason for that. Once you allow people to express themselves... Everybody moves forward because there's always a consensus of ideas. And when you bring everybody's opinions together, you'll be able to make good judgments. Not just one person. You know, two heads, will, two good heads will always be better than one. It's 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 a no it's, it's a no brainer. So yeah, when I heard that, I just knew that no Nigerians, we don't we always like to repeat bad history. We always do. So right now that we have just two more years to the end of this this regime, I would actually call it a regime. Um, I'm a bit, a bit more hopeful for Nigeria. That is if, you know, Nigeria remains intact till then. I'm just hoping that it does. And if it does, 
then you know i hope that the next person to come would really really at least be better than what we have right now because right now it's a mess it's a real mess i mean that's heavy calling it eric jane but i i, I do share your sentiments and there's a word that comes to mind when i think about just if i could come up with a word that has described my perception which might not mirror the actual reality, but my perception, and I think a lot of Nigerians, the Nigerian youths like me, they, they feel the same way, will be palliative. A word that I think describes the way the government has treated us, almost like there's somebody dying, and they, they've already seen Nigeria as a third state. And so what they're just doing right now is a palliative care. You know, let's just give them, let them just, let's send them, you know, in a very, less some form of dignified way to their death. And even palliative as a word, you know, to to just throw handouts, you know, these are not people that we, we should care about. And perhaps maybe that's not the intention of the government, but their rhetorics and their actions have been, you know, they've been in this, this dissonance. And I hope that they do the right thing. And so here's to all the youth out there. Please get involved in governance. You know, know your history. There's so many things that they've used to distract us. I'll use one example, Big Brother, and all those fads that come and go. I won't be surprised if after, you know, next week something comes up again like a scandal and then this news becomes, you know, old news. Please, let's get very involved in what's going on in the country. Write to your constituents. Um, if you are able to run for an office, please do that. And the change will start with us. It, it's going to be a long years down to come. I don't even think a lot of us alive right now will be able to see the, the fruits of that labor. But it starts today. If you want to enjoy a tree, there's a Chinese proverb about if you want to enjoy a tree, like planting, I don't know, I forget how to really say it, but it's almost like f- planting a tree is not for you. It's almost for like your, your children and children and children. That exactly. Time. So when you start having that mentality of, you know, um, think about the future, not very, we shouldn't be survival mode all the time. I know it's difficult, you know, living in our country, but let's think about the future. Let's do things, you know, um, in, for the people that are coming, you know, um, ahead of us well i'm done all of my questions and i want to say thank you so much um i i do appreciate your time and i also you know please stay safe and um i wish you the very best and i hope that your your business tourism you know um gets back up again thank you so much for having me Mo. it's always a pleasure being here uh my friend i hope the next time we talk we have you know something less morbid to talk about because exactly i just just hope it to be hopeful news yes yes better news better news well guys that was it don't forget to check out the podcast and i remain your host most of all right i'll let you know when it comes back this is a hard topic hey guys it's mo here again i wanted to provide an update that i think is very critical to this episode and this happened right after we taped the episode with ada so on friday the 4th of june the federal government of nigeria placed a temporary suspension on twitter operations in the country after twitter took down the president's tweets threatening the Igbo ethnic group although some nigerians are still accessing twitter using virtual private network also known as vpn the government, through the Minister of Justice, has threatened to prosecute those still tweeting. There's also an ongoing motion being raised to regulate the use of other social media platforms in the country. The Nigerian government has said that Twitter, Facebook, and other social media giants must register in the country and be governed by the Broadcasting Commission. I mean, this is just... Are we in communist China? The move by the government has not only affected the livelihood of many Nigerians, especially the youth, who depend on Twitter and other similar social media platforms for not only their businesses, but also for networking. But this is also a threat to the freedom of speech in the country. Just thought to update you guys. And I think it's just bonkers, really. I think it's just bonkers. This is regression as far as I'm concerned. Are they not? Like, what next? They're going to be banning, you know, freedom of, of expression in the country. Ah, Nigeria, which way? Let's just stop it already. All right, bye for now. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Morosable Podcast. Well, guess what? There's plenty more where that came from. So visit our website at www.mosibyl.com. That is www.mosibyl.com, where you can find hours of other binge-worthy episodes just like this one. And while you're at it, please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Podbean as it encourages other awesome people like you to listen to the podcast as well. We are now officially on Podbean. It has an app. You can catch up on missed episodes and also get a notification when we have new episodes. Do you have a question for our guest, feedback on the episode, or a suggestion for a future guest? Then please get in touch with us by sending us an email at talktomore at mostable.com or connect with us via Instagram 
at the Moral Civil Podcast. Cannot wait to hear from you and thank you so much for always listening.